All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. After a brief break, we have now arrived at the final session of our workshop. <clears throat> and during this session, I'll be joined by all the moderators from the five previous sessions. Um, we'll discuss some of the key findings and recommendations from the workshop speakers. Um, we'll focus on how to make the successful COVID-19 adaptation stick going forward. How we'll continue to learn about the impact and effectiveness of adaptations that are still being addressed and how we can prevent reversion to pre-COVID policies and procedures that are deemed no longer necessary or effective. Um, <clears throat> so again, a quick note on the structure of the session. Um, each of the co-moderators will provide a brief synopsis of the session that they ran, emphasizing action-oriented recommendations they heard throughout the presentations and discussion. I hope they will also focus a bit on um, you know, what is any potential obstacles to implementing those recommendations and how those obstacles can be overcome. Um, <clears throat> I may drill into a, a, a few things along the way with some more specific questions, but generally speaking, following the session summaries, we'll have a roundtable discussion among all of us. Again, we encourage uh, all the participants to send in your comments and questions using the chat box on the website. Um, and you know, we, we are very much interested in engaging you in this conversation uh, for this final session of the workshop. So with that said, I think we can get started and I will turn it over to the session one co-moderators, uh, Drs. Davidson and Shulman for a little bit of a summary of their session. Thanks so much, Rich. If we could have the next slide, please. Uh, the format that we were asked to follow was to provide a slide about the key takeaways from our session and then recommendations. And so I want to tell you about the things that we heard from the wonderful panelists who joined us in session one, which you remember was a session which was designed to sort of set the stage to remind us of where we were 18 months ago as we all entered into the pandemic. And so what we heard from our speakers in the discussion was that first, let's not forget it was a time of great uncertainty and fear, even for oncologists. And I think we're used to a lot of uncertainty and we certainly have a lot of fear sometimes for our patients. But it also highlighted pre-existing really deep disparities in the United States. I think for us, it was also the realization that the show has to go on for oncology patients. And of course, our need to serve our patients had to be tempered by the need to work within our larger health ecosystem where the needs for other things were so great. One of the things that was in our favor is that we were able to capitalize on our traditional strength in infection control and oncology. We are used to taking care of people in an immunosuppressed setting and thinking about infection prevention. This clearly magnified for all of us the need for communication, for organization, and for really clear lines of command. It also confirmed for us the value of having pre-existing response structures that could pivot for the moment. Um, an example that was given was adding infectious disease specialists to our incident command structures. Um, it also facilitated collaboration between traditional competitors we heard, for example, about how practices in a single town came together. Um, it also helped us to think a little bit about um, how different professional societies could come together. And I'm embarrassed to say, Rich, that I can't read my seventh point because on my computer, it's off the screen. Could you, maybe Larry could read it? Yeah, I could, I could read it, Nancy. Thank it's, you, Larry. <laughs> it, technology, huh? We're still working on it. Yep. Um, Point seven is driven by the needs of cancer patients in the context of the larger society. Thank you. Let me turn it over to Larry, because uh, this is what we took away. And then Larry was going to summarize what we thought were some of the action points. Great. Thank you, Nancy. If we could go to the next slide, please. So we have um, six recommendations going forward. Uh, and I think these really are generated out of um, looking back and saying, geez, these are the things that we did that actually got us through this terrible time, uh, as Nancy described. And these are the things that made it work. And in fact, they're good things. Um, so this terrible pandemic has taught us that there are some things that we can do better. Uh, number one was structure matters, and it's both societal and institutional. But that's really so much of what allows us to do the right things um, and do them efficiently and uh, correctly. Uh, we can work together and we shouldn't lose that collaborative spirit. And it was amazing to me 
how many groups came together. Nancy mentioned small competing oncology groups, but many professional societies, larger cancer centers all came together because we needed to bail out the ship and feel like we were working together because that was really the only way to keep going. But we need to keep doing that. We need to keep working together and put what have been traditional, really competitive barriers aside. Continuous and accurate communication has never been more important. Uh, it both engenders trust in the stakeholders, but also again, allows us to efficiently and agilely move forward. The ability of the healthcare workforce to rapidly innovate and adapt is an asset. Well, this was really amazing. The types of things that we really did within weeks of uh, the pandemic's onset in the US. Um, you know, I'm one of the older people on this panel, if not the oldest one. And I can't remember any time in medicine where we did things so quickly and pivoted so quickly uh, to the benefit of our patients and overall healthcare. Partnerships from government, regulatory agencies, payers. Uh, again, these are normally competitive groups. Uh, we shouldn't really be competitive. We should always have the best interests of the patients in mind. But the nature of what we do and the nature of uh, what drives our organizations often makes us at odds with each other. But we all came together and we came together quickly, again, focusing on the needs of our cancer patients. And finally, and this uh, really goes back to Rich Shilsky's comment yesterday, was um, you know there was a sense of urgency spirit of collaboration, tremendous energy early in the pandemic that got us through that as best as we could. Um, but we shouldn't lose that urgency and collaboration and energy going forward. And though COVID has receded a little bit, though we're still worried about the next wave uh, with the Delta variant, uh, the reality is that we still have more than a half million people dying of cancer every year in the US. And that should be a cause for urgency a cause for collaboration and a cause to continue our focus and our energy going forward. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, Rich, thank you very much for allowing us to speak. Well, thank you both. Um, <clears throat> some great takeaways, but I, you know, I guess Larry and Nancy, I would push you just a little bit more on this last point, right? Um, because the question is how, how to do it. Um, you know, COVID created both the need and to some extent the incentive to do it because of the need to protect our patients and the need to protect our healthcare system. Um, you know, and as you say, I mean, there are as many people who die every year from cancer in this country as who have died so far from COVID. Now, none of those are happy statistics, but the question is, you know, if we believe that we need to continue to maintain this collaboration, this communication, this energy to solve the problem, what has to be done to create the incentives uh, to, to actually do that? Well, you know, Rich, um, I used to give a talk uh, some time ago uh, looking at certain uh, medicines that in fact had substantial effects on curates. Trastuzumab might be a good example in early breast cancer. And every year that it was delayed, that that medicine got through all the trials before it got FDA approved for early stage breast cancer, which was in the 2000s, um, we could count how many people in the US died because that was not part of standard treatment. Um, and that's a sobering statistic. Uh, and I think we need to hold that up in front of us. We need to realize you know, really not to be melodramatic about it, but people's lives are on the line um, if we don't move things forward appropriately and safely, but as quickly as possible. And I think, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm the son of a psychiatrist, that's probably irrelevant, but, um, you know, the, the difference between the COVID pandemic and life in general is that life in general is sort of the same year to year. And it's hard to maintain that energy and that focus. COVID rocked all of our boats. Uh, but uh, we need to take a hard look at what the, um, you know, what the stakes are here uh, and remind I, ourselves. I'm sorry. Yes. You, no, I, go I ahead. Also, Rich, that one of the things that we're challenged by in cancer is there's a sort of, I don't want to say complacency or fatalism, but, you know, I think a lot of people, it's almost part of the landscape 
and we lose track of the individual stories, you know, the individual people who are so affected. We don't see those folks on the front page of the New York Times. We don't see those temporary morgues that we saw with COVID, which were so, so, you know, um, distressing to so many. And so trying to think about how we capture that urgency and our patients definitely feel it um, and use that to do what I think is the single most important thing that's come out of this symposium from my point of view, which is to really cut the red tape. You know, what Larry said, the bureaucracy, we learned a lot of bureaucracy that we can do just fine without. And nobody was compromised. People's health and well-being were not compromised by cutting out those things. So we've got to take that and put it into other diseases like the cancers um, consistently um, and continue to innovate and to try to streamline and, you know, trim this down as much as we possibly can. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great point. And, you know, we all realize where there are inefficiencies in both care and research uh, and redundancies and, you know, unnecessary steps, uh, unnecessary data collection. Um, and, you know, I think uh, our, our community, you know, has to take responsibility for pointing these things out, developing data if it's necessary to prove that, that some of these things are useless uh, and then demanding change. I mean, <clears throat> and it, you know, it, it's gotta be at every level, including at the level of our institutions. I mean, we, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it can no longer be the case that an academic medical center takes six months to negotiate a contract to start a clinical trial. I mean, there are lives on the line while people are waiting to get into that clinical trial. Um, and somehow transferring that urgency from the medical staff <clears throat> to the legal staff, to the administrators and so on, uh, you know, has gotta be something that, uh, you know, anyone who's a leader in a healthcare system or a cancer center, you know, has to take on that responsibility. Having been one of those people, you know, maybe one action item we could consider here is expanding the stakeholders that come to the National Cancer Policy Forum or that receive this information to have our general counsel that's working with contracts from the, from the cancer program, um, et cetera. I, mean, there's, I don't think there's a cancer center out there that does not want to expedite uh, contracting or feel frustrated by it. So, so perhaps including a wider breadth of stakeholders is something we can do, own, and control uh, with this information. It's a really uh, interesting point, Karen, <clears throat> you know, considering that the people we sort of complain about um, are not sitting at the same table with us when we're doing the complaining. Um, that was my thought. <laughs> and, you know, just as we heard so much about um, throughout this whole meeting about um, engaging the community, I mean, they're part of our community, uh, and uh, maybe we need to engage them a little bit more um, aggressively. Um, so um, I'm sure that, that that's a terrific idea. Action items of what your legal counsel team can do to help save lives for cancer, right? Just make it easy for them. These are actionable steps. And, and I think one way to think about this, that, you know, there's a, a lot of things in life that are out of our control. We all know a lot of them, but there are some things that are in fact in our control and it should be our responsibility to take control of those things and get to a better place. And we just need to be honest with ourselves about where we can make a difference and where we can take control and improve things. Yeah, and I'll just make one last comment before we move on to the, the next group. I mean, you know, in, in where I've lived uh, most of my career, Larry, as you know, in, you know, in the clinical trials arena, um, I think most of what uh, we complain about in the way clinical trials were organized are things of our own making. Um, and, you know, we have created these problems and we can fix these problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to do that. Um, so uh, great, great discussion, great takeaways and great, some great new ideas surfaced. Um, let's go on to um, session two and that uh, the co-moderators are Tony Rebus and Jim Dorsho. Thank you. And this discussion really leads to, to session two. I'll go over the, the takeaways and, uh, and uh, Jim will, will, uh, will give the recommendations from the session. So but, uh, our session was supposed uh, was uh, discussing about the implications of co the COVID-19 pandemic on the conduct of cancer clinical trials and the changes and adaptations that had, uh, had uh, been forced uh, uh, due to the pandemic. And we had some uh, data that is striking. One of them is that, uh, well, it's it was clear to all of us that COVID-19 forced the most unprecedented change 
in clinical trial conduct in modern oncology. Uh, for two months, for example, uh, we were told that at metadata, there was 0% verification of data entry. That's unprecedented, and you know how many implications that has. And then the sharp decrease on clinical trial participation with recovery, but still, and uh, uh, Jim Dorshaw said that the NCCN trials was still a 20% uh, decrease in, 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 um, in participation compared to pre-pandemic. There were many adaptations that helped the conduct of clinical trials and made it possible to continue clinical trials. And they were mostly sent uh, doing turning the clinical trial patient center as opposed to, be, to being a clinical site center. And that's a concept that has been recurrent in, in, in this workshop throughout the two days with uh, the implementation of remote consenting, decentralized interventions and, tel and uh, incorporation of telemedicine. Uh, we all agree that decentralized clinical trials will facilitate participation in more diverse populations. We do not need to have a cancer center in every single community and uh, uh, underserved communities should have the, the access to clinical trials. And this uh, would uh, decentralize, decentralized clinical trial conduct would, would favor these. Um, there's also a, there was discussion uh, about the large, uh, uh, that's been recurring in the workshop, the late stage clinical trials should focus on the primary endpoints. Does the drug work or not in this indication and minimize everything else that comes in. We don't care about the RDW in one arm or the other. We care about did it work or not. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? So uh, um, the adaptations of clinical trial conduct were based on the application of, of existing technologies and, and regulations, not creating new ones in a matter of one or two months which tells us that the clinical trials enterprise had been reluctant to incorporate these technologies and act on existing FDA regulations that allow uh, remote consenting and telemedicine and decentralized clinical trials. We were not doing it by ourselves. We were forced to do it and we had to adapt by taking on these, uh, uh, these, these advances that are welcome. Um, we hope we, we are, we're going to keep them and that's the, uh, uh, on the next, uh, uh, the next steps. Uh, there were some points that were made on uh, um, the limitations on, on the continued conduct of clinical trials during the pandemic, issues about access of uh, medical records for auditing, uh, on, on contract issues and legal issues with, with, uh, with HIPAA, and then the decreasing clinical trials workforce. It's been hit us all really hard. It's high, hard to maintain trained staff. It's been really hard to hire new staff to support, uh, support them. So I think it's, we're going to have a slow recovery from all of these. Finally, I want to bring up what our patient advocate told us, uh, Jane Permaro said, uh, she ended her presentation saying, don't go back, don't go back to the old ways. We have an opportunity to implement long-term benefits in, in changes in clinical trial conduct that have been accelerated by the pandemic, not just created by the pandemic. So I'll turn it to Jim. So next slide. So let me just say that to me, the most important thing from our session is, and it almost seems like a contradiction in terms, but we need to institutionalize change. Usually we institutionalize lack of change um, so that uh, all the things that were necessitated by the pandemic um, are, are become second nature while at the same time we're developing the data to convince sponsors and regulators that these changes really need to be long lived. Um, and we need to build upon these wonderful decentralization efforts to expand trial accrual to underserved communities um, with enhanced collaborations, show how we can even further broaden eligibility criteria and develop trials to emphasize clinical research questions in these underserved communities. And I think above all, uh, we need to retain this focus on improving the flexibility, speed and effectiveness of our system while ensuring patient safety and scientific integrity. It, I think that the key word is flexibility. Uh, we learned how flexible you need to be in a pandemic and uh, we just can't lose sight of how important that is uh, going forward. Great. <clears throat> um, thank you both. Um, really important points made. I, I wonder if we could talk for a minute a little bit further about you know, efforts at decentralizing trials. I mean, you know, that, uh, that, that embodies a whole spectrum of activities, of course, right? In terms of 
you know, where patients are consented, where they're treated, where they're evaluated, how they're evaluated, by whom, um, uh, you know, and so on. But it, it would seem that there's, except for the most unsafe, the most risky, or the most technically complex trials, virtually all trials should have some elements of decentralized care and evaluation in the trial. And, you know, when, when I think about <clears throat> um, requirements that uh, imaging studies be obtained at the trial center, uh, I mean, this makes really no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, almost every clinical trial protocol that I've ever looked at, and I've looked at hundreds of them, say things like the patient should be evaluated with a CT scan or an MRI. It doesn't say how the CT scan should be performed. It doesn't say what the infusion protocol should be. It doesn't say anything about the characteristics of the machine on which the images are obtained. There's absolutely no reason that I can think of uh, you know, that um, imaging studies shouldn't be able to be obtained anywhere you know, close to the patient's home. Now, where they are read and interpreted might be a different issue. But of course, since all imaging is digital these days, it's easy to send the digital file to a central expert reader if that's necessary for the integrity of the trial. But that, you know, in my mind, is just one of these examples of things we keep perpetuating for, as far as I can tell, no good reason whatsoever. Um, and just, you know, would wonder, you know, Jim, obviously one of the roles that the NCI has, of course, is reviewing trials. Um, and you know, it, it would seem to me that between the NCI and the FDA, who you know, one or the other uh, agency um, has some review function for the vast majority of clinical trials that are done in this country, um, you know, implementing, asking these kinds of questions in the review process, uh, you know, can it really help you know push us toward you know creating this more decentralized approach, which we believe. Uh, I'm not sure we have data yet, but we, we at least believe would facilitate um, more rapid and more diverse patient enrollment in trials. So, so Rich, I, I would agree with you 100%. I think one of the reasons that uh, some of this stuff has just been perpetuated uh, from the days of yore is that uh, there are fears about uh, you know what will be required if it's a registration set. And, and, and as you well know, as we all know, those, those are fears. They're not realized fears, but they are just fears. And to me, the thing that proved how decentralized you can get, and I'm sure this, you could probably say the same thing about the taper study, but if MATCH proved anything, it proved that we could do sophisticated biopsies um, at uh, over a thousand sites, right? The quality of which by and large were outstanding, right? And so well, if you can do that, then you know, there aren't very many studies that are uh, phase two and beyond that you can't do in a decentralized fashion. Yep. Uh, I'll give you another quick example. <clears throat> 10 years ago, um, I was involved in a study that uh, ASCO did um, looking at what would be the uh, result of um, limiting the amount of safety data collected in clinical trials that were seeking a supplemental indication. So, you know, for a drug already marketed for one purpose, but now randomized phase three trial looking for a new indication. And we reanalyzed eight prospective clinical trials performed by a variety of different sponsors. <clears throat> and the output of that, which was published in JCO and ultimately presented to the FDA, was that um, by and large, one could eliminate the collection of all low-grade AEs one could collect only a random sample of higher grade AEs and collect all SAEs, and you would not miss any clinically meaningful safety signal by reducing the data collection to that extent. So we went to the FDA after that paper was published um, at their invitation and presented it to the medical reviewers. And this speaks to a point that I think Rob Califf made in the last session about sometimes a disconnect between leadership and the rank and file. Um, because when we presented the data, um, lots of hands went up and the questions that were asked always began with what if, you know, what if something happened that wasn't collected? Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's that sort of um, uh, 
concern, that, that sort of conservative view of the need to collect every last shred of data uh, that you know, is, an, is an obstacle, I think, to simplifying um, some of our clinical trial processes. I think Don is, asked, Don is asking, can she make a comment? Of course, Donna, please. So I, I think just given the, the conversation around uh, the FDA, I felt uh, it might be reasonable to jump in. So I, I just want to say, you know, uh, a lot of the conversation is always context dependent. So in general, we're supportive of decentralized trials, right? This concept of bringing the trial to the patient, to their communities. Uh, you've seen us in, in terms of broadening eligibility criteria. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that in this space, we really uh, feel that we wanna support and make it patient centric. The, the key questions on the flip side of that are, you know, what exactly is being decentralized? You mentioned imaging for, as an example, and so, you know, how is that being measured? What's the population? What's the intervention? And then exactly what elements are being collected and what's the approach? So, you know, centralized reading or for, for example, uh, the, the current context of clinical trials, many are using a decentralized approach and we'll continue to evaluate any concerns around safety signals or uh, any issues related to that, but as far as data integrity and variability, it really centers on data integrity. So if we feel like the data integrity is intact, that is the essential factor in ensuring safety, and we're going to continue looking at this. Yeah, thanks, Don. I mean, I think you're actually making the, the critical point here, which is that, you know, when we design and implement clinical trials, we have to think of it from the perspective of what question are we asking, what information do we need to collect to answer the question, and how is it best collected? Um, and you know, instead of just doing the same thing all the time for every clinical trial, <clears throat> you know, there are trials which will lend themselves very well to decentralized um, implementation and data collection. There will be trials for which that will be less appropriate. But the point is that the, the trial operation should be fit for purpose with respect to the trial objectives, right? And just not the same thing all the time because that's the way we've always done it. Well, terrific. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to some of these points, but I want to be sure we give everybody a chance to give their report out. So let's go on to uh, group three, uh, which is uh, Karen and Larissa. All right, so I will start us off. So um, first I wanted to go over some of the key takeaways from our uh, session. So what was clear is that um, telehealth has some benefits for patients, healthcare providers, and possibly for systems as well and is likely to further expand usage in, in the cancer care continuum and clinical trials. So expand usage meaning beyond what was used pre-pandemic. Um, and uh, though we will never probably go to um, the use of telehealth to the same extent as was used during the, the peak of the COVID pandemic, um, we will certainly um, have opportunities to expand usage from where we were um, initially. Um, as many are familiar, um, you know, the VA had it available for many years and was utilizing it. Uh, we in our healthcare system um, had virtual visits that were available, but were uh, drastically underused. The system um, to use telehealth was very um, clunky. It was external to the um, healthcare system, uh, to the healthcare um, uh, EHR, um, and, you know, really there was no motivation at all to use it. So I think as we go forward, um, this is something that um, uh, remains a great uh, potential going forward. Um, but, uh, of course, there are barriers um, to use of telehealth, which are related to e-technology um, and overall healthcare uh, literacy uh, we discussed uh, geography, insurance, socioeconomic status, regulatory requirements, um, and others. Um, but there are mechanisms that many of our institutions have, have already utilized to reduce uh, disparities, and some were mentioned, such as the use of kiosk, um, training um, patients, training staff, availability of voice-only option instead of using voice with video, um, expansion of broadband and, and others. And the other point that was brought up, um, which is really um, critically important, is that multidisciplinary uh, telehealth approaches, which include nurses that can monitor patients um, using PROs, 
um, uh, integrating nurse practitioner, uh, physician assistants, and other healthcare professionals, including, for example, physical therapists. Um, so in our survivorship clinic, um, you know, many of our patients have challenges getting to the physical therapy appointment. Um, but the availability of even having telemedicine for physical therapy where somebody can assess a patient, determine what they need and kind of get them going until they come in for an in-person consultation was definitely worthwhile. And of course, I mean, psycho psychosocial, psychological uh, care. And then also um, telehealth has the potential to improve care, um, communication and coordination um, for everyone involved in the care of the patient. So bringing the oncology team together with primary care providers and other specialists. And I will now turn this over to uh, Karen for the next steps. Thank you, Larissa. This is uh, you know, one of those slides that I think would keep growing if we kept this policy forum going on for another few sessions. Virtually, literally every session talked about telehealth and had concepts for telehealth. So a clear one is that you know, this is not going away anytime soon. So a, a sense of urgency to refine what we can is, is something that we should capitalize on. So what are the barriers? Larissa talked about what some of those are. Uh, action items that were suggested by the panelists are removing state licensure requirements, making it easy uh, in order to deliver telehealth across state lines, or expanding compacts and, uh, com compacts and contracts across adjacent states. That will take some potential advocacy at the state level. And as the CEO of the American Cancer Society, I can tell you that's something we're actually highly attuned to at the moment and uh, invested in. So we'd like to work with the cancer centers and key oncology stakeholders in order to help get that done. It's something we believe in. The second is to expand insurance for coverages provided across state lines. Again, that's a major barrier with parity for voice only and video based visits. So this is something that we heard quite a lot about from some of the community physicians that were within the panel and was echoed throughout. The third tractable action item is to promote a patient, patient centered research on how we can best implement telehealth. So what is the right type of clinical visit and how, you know, how can this all optimally be used for clinical trials as a follow up by, by telehealth. So this should include the key stakeholders, the patient, their caregiver, but also the provider. What's the impact on the provider for finding this place and space for telehealth within the cancer care continuum? And that will take research. We did hear about some efforts from the NCI to go ahead and fund centers. Uh, I think they talked about funding three centers to take this comprehensive approach to look at, at telehealth through that lens. Um, but I would submit that we'll, we'll need to learn from more than just three centers, understanding that the way that we deliver telehealth and how it gets implemented may vary uh, dramatically dependent on the demographic, dependent on the region and the specific needs of the patients that the catchment area serves. Lastly, uh, and maybe this should have actually been the first, and that's to engage with advocates and organizations to help refine tel telehealth usage implementation. A theme that we heard today is the importance of having the patient at the table for the design stage, not the refine and react phase. Uh, and this, the overall goal here is to refine this new technology, which we know is here to stay and will only grow in capacity to the benefits of patients, caregivers, and providers. So I'll stop there. And I think that I suspect there'll be some vibrant commentary. Well, thank you, Karen. I mean, uh, and Larissa, I think those are great. And you know, fairly specific recommendations, which is you know, one of the things we're hoping to get out of this workshop. Um, you know, talk a little bit about exactly what needs to be done by what entity um, to achieve what objective. Um, but actually, I wanted to um, ask a, a bit more for your thoughts about um, maybe sort of hybrid uh, visits uh, under some circumstances in the future. And one of the things I think we heard in your session um, was the you know, ability to bring in other people into the exam room, if you will, um, using telehealth. So, you know, I, I could imagine, I suppose you could imagine, but would love to hear your thoughts, circumstances under which the patient might be in the physical facility with the oncologist, um, but maybe um, the family and maybe even other members of the care team, you know, palliative medicine physicians or pharmacists or others, um, are um, brought into the conversation 
on a video screen. Um, and, and do, do any of you have any experience with those sorts of arrangements so far? Do they seem to work? Are there, are there barriers to, to doing those sorts of uh, arrangements? I mean, it seems fairly complicated to get everybody coordinated to be in the right place at the right time. But I just wonder if at the end of the day, um, you know, that might be a strategy that can work for some patients under some circumstances. Well, so one of the great things about our session is that we had people who, you know, had to come from whole cloth and create telehealth at their institutions and others that already had it in place and needed to escalate. So, you know, for, for those places that had it already in, for those centers that already had it in place, there was a lot to learn. You know, one of them was ours at Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson. In that case, virtual grand rounds is actually, or virtual rounds is something that actually happens already. So the patient's in place, uh, you know, the providers are there, other members of the care team and caregivers can also dial in. So I, th I think that's a natural extension of telehealth, but I'd be curious to hear what other people's experiences have been. Yeah, I mean, the way that I have done um, some sort of multi-people uh, um, telehealth is um, with a patient and their family member both being in two separate places. So um, the patient's parents or children, um, you know, my, or sister actually, you know, would join in with, um, with the patient, you know, so then the three of us would be in three distinct um, places. Um, and those have been uh, really terrific and have, I think, really helped the distant relative, sort of distant physically relative to be able to participate in the session. I've had working uh, caregivers who didn't have to take a day off from work so that they can join um, mom or their, um, you know, their child for, um, for a visit. So clearly that has a benefit. Um, the other way that I have used it is um, doing a co-session with our nurse practitioner and physician assistant. Um, so let's say if a patient is a bit more um, sort of medically challenging, complicated, um, the nurse practitioner would then um, invite me to join the, um, the telemedicine as well. And I think that that allowed me to physically kind of be there um, in the room. And then the fourth example that we have not really talked about is teaching. Um, and I have had virtual students, virtual residents um, who have um, both shadowed me and then I've been able to precept with them um, on a remote visit as well. So one of the things we didn't really quite talk about that dovetails with one of the other sessions is the, you know, the growing consolidation in healthcare. So the hub and spoke model where there's a, ten, there's a the, for all the right reasons, the desire to get cancer out into the community. But then this creates limitations in your ability to physically have your specialists on site. So telehealth, and we experienced this also, is a really great way to get your specialists you know, on site for the time that they need to be there. Where we had not gone yet, which I, th I think would be really terrific, it would be to facilitate multidisciplinary clinics. So just the physical scheduling of multi-D clinics, I know we've all felt the pain of that. The telehealth can, I think, be refined to help uh, to help ease the logistic burden of, of having a multidisciplinary clinic. You know, Karen, we did do that during the pandemic for early stage breast cancer multidisciplinary evaluation. What we didn't do, though, is actually get all the docs in the same room at the same time. But we were able to be in a position where the patient and their family was there, and then various disciplines would zoom in and out. Um, to wherever that patient was. Um, and it, it worked very effectively. And we use this particularly actually in some of our older patients at the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. because we really didn't want them in our healthcare system, uh, facilities. And I was impressed at how those patients, sometimes with the support of their family members, were able to be ready to navigate and to take full advantage of this. Also, sometimes the economics of, a, of putting together a multidisciplinary clinic are challenging, right? You know, in terms of the way reimbursement goes. I wonder if this is a way to address some of the economic challenges that are barriers to delivering cancer care in the way, way that we know adds value to the patient and improves their outcome. Yeah, I think the one challenge would be if you believe in the value of the physical exam, it's very tough to do. And, and again, well, early stage breast cancer, our radiation oncologist and, and surgical oncologist particularly would say that they need to do that physical exam. So there are some limitations in some cases. But maybe a research question, you know, that could be added is, Absolutely. is there a way to refine the, the multidisciplinary clinic to include telehealth as an enabler? Just a thought. 
One, one other quick question I just wanted to ask you all is, um, <clears throat> You know, we heard a lot of discussion about uh, lack of access to broadband and Wi-Fi and internet and potential solutions to that. Somebody in your session mentioned, um, you know, maybe setting up Wi-Fi hotspots and big box stores. Somebody else mentioned having traveling buses with Wi-Fi hotspots. But one thing that occurs to me is, um, you know, m most communities have a pharmacy and many communities have a library. Um, and I just wonder about um, you know, whether those are venues um, where people might be able to go, you know, schedule a 20 minute time in a private space with a good Wi-Fi connection to have a telemedicine visit. Um, you know, and and that, uh, that could be a real valuable service that are offered by those facilities in you know, particularly smaller communities. Yeah, I think we we probably just had a little bit. It was on the first slide the concept of kiosks. I think it's a, it's a really an inviting one and potentially good for partnership with other industries to pull that off. Well, great. Well, clearly lots to uh, talk about in terms of um, telehealth. It seems to me if we could resolve the uh, licensure issue, uh, we could go a long way toward making it um, a lot more um, feasible and accessible. Um, so let's go on to uh, session. Four. Um, this is uh, Randy Oyer and uh, Rob Wynn reporting out. Thanks, uh, Rich. Uh, Rob and I, first of all, would like to thank our terrific panelists and uh, thank you for inviting us to be part of this. Uh, our key takeaways are the following five. Our patient advocate, uh, Shanta Chambers, made it very clear that unaddressed social determinants of health undermine medical advances for individuals and populations yet social determinants of health are incompletely and unreliably collected, measured, considered, and acted upon. And I would add that uh, we all feel some sense of urgency about this. Uh, secondly, uh, Drs. Pierce and Nunez-Smith made it uh, clear that uh, healthcare is a community enterprise, yet cancer centers often have inadequate connection with and sustained presence in many communities and geographies. Uh, third point, Drs. Uh, Wingfield and Christensen uh, made it clear that access, quality of services, and outcomes vary unacceptably across communities, distance from cancer centers, and regional geography. All of our speakers uh, touched on structural inequities, structural barriers, racism, and bias, all causing injustice in cancer care delivery and health outcomes. Chris Lathan uh, made uh, made the point that cancer care delivery is more adaptable than previously realized and all the speakers uh, felt that we needed to do better than the, to do better than the uh, pre-pandemic. We must learn from this experience. Uh, off to you, Dr. Wynn. Thank you. And I think as far as our recommendations, uh, and this was a robust discussion, and uh, I think Randy and I enjoyed this a lot. Um, when we think about social determinants, they must be reliably collected. They must be incorporated into care and actually more than just collecting, what are you gonna do with the information? How are we gonna act upon them? That's really a key critical component of where we're gonna move through this sort of COVID period. The collection and utilization of the social determinants of health should be tied to receiving research dollars as well. And how are we gonna do that? Um, research must identify that, which social determinants of health are useful. And uh, teams must learn how to ask and listen for social determinants of health. And one of the things that came out of this was, as we're talking about social determinants of health, it shouldn't be unidirectional. It really should be getting the community voice at the table, also talking about some of those social determinants of health that we're not thinking about. Number two, the NCI should use the cancer center model to require specific features and metrics of community partnerships that result in meaningful, sustained and effective engagement that first and foremost builds trust and improves outcomes in uh, the catchment area. And I think when we're talking about um, the push um, to improve impact in catchments, we're getting that, but this a part about effective engagement that builds trust, I think is something that um, through COVID we're recognizing is becoming increasingly important of how to do and we must do. Um, number three, Close, close gaps in access to care with payment models, digital processes, 
removing social need barriers, and building networks that provide cancer center level care outside of the cancer center. And I think that you hear that as a recurring theme uh, throughout almost this entire discussion. Um, number four, acceptance of Medicaid. It seems easy. Must be an absolute requirement for, for the receipt of any federal funding. And that was a message that came loud and clear that we're not going to be able to close any disparity gap without all of us actually being able to see at-risk populations like our Medicaid patients. And then lastly, we must retain professional and lay navigation, high-functioning team-based care, care coordination, and distributed care closer to home. And one of the big takeaways from this and one of the big recommendations is that we need to stop giving lip service to navigation and start putting resources towards it. Wow, um, <clears throat> lot to unpack there. Um, Rob, I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you a question about the first recommendation. So <clears throat> um, if, uh, if Medicare came in and said, well, we are going to pay, um, or conversely, we're gonna give a penalty if data are not collected uh, on social determinants of health in the EMR, kind of like you know the meaningful use concept. Um, uh, if, if Medicare came in and said, you can have five data elements that must be collected on every cancer patient, at least at the first encounter, what are the five that you would want to have collected? Wow. I, um, so the very first thing is I'm going to give you a couple, and then I'm going to say that one of the things that I'd like to do would be to bring in community, because I don't think we've had community voice involved in these social terms of health, but notwithstanding, I would first of all want to know people's housing, their housing situations. I think we make assumption that sometimes because people are put together when they see us in our clinic that they're not having living in their cars. Particularly as we're getting through COVID, we're finding out more and more that people who had jobs or people who are struggling are struggling also with housing. So housing, you know, do you have sustainable housing and do you have a safe place to live? Number two, food insecurity is is is, is real. The truth of the matter is I would want to know, are, do you eat every day? I mean, just at a minimum, do you have access to good, high quality food every day? Number three, transportation. Number four, do you feel safe? I mean, I know that seems like simple questions to ask, but sometimes just simply asking someone if they're safe or not opens up a whole uh, you know, discussion about other things that they're dealing with within their communities. So I would sort of start off with those big sort of topics. And I would say that those are just big topics that to be quite honest with you, I've been thinking about this a lot because asking someone about their zip code is just simply not enough. Well, that's a great- I'd like to, Yeah, great. I'd like to add something to that, Rich. I, I think that Rob is really wise to uh, put up there upfront to uh, ask the patients or the patient community I would add one uh, that we find is really important in our clinic, and that is the presence or absence of a competent caregiver. That is a key factor uh, in, for us in you know, following our OCM data, whether or not somebody ends up in the hospital, for example. It's true. So, so what is to stop us from you know, advocating for, at the very least, but somehow forcing the change to make collection of these data elements a requirement. Um, and, and I, you know, I presume that <clears throat> in order for it to actually be collected, you know, it's one thing to say it's required, but in order to actually make it happen, there either has to be an incentive or a penalty, uh, unfortunately, because just saying it's the right thing to do does, is no guarantee it'll happen. Um, so, you know, who, who do we have to talk to, to get these things as required a uh, set of data elements in the medical record? Well, I wouldn't mind uh, having it as a requirement from the Office of the National Coordinator for EMR certification. I know uh, you floated that idea as well, Rich and, and Rob. Uh, I don't know how that would, how, how that would go across. I, I also think that this should be part of getting paid. You know, we yeah. do other things with insurances about, you know, you know, reimbursements and things. But I think that these are um, not just soft questions. These are being are necessary questions, particularly as we recognize COVID did one thing for us. 
it not only opened our eyes that these issues were happening, but we have more people who are now affected by inadequate of housing or food insecurities and these other things. So I think if we're really serious about our cancer patients, we must answer these. And um, it starts at home. So, you know, but I do think we'll need CMS and others. Beginning to feel to me like uh, tumor staging. You know, it's the TNM of uh, how a person lives their life. Sorry, You're Dr. Oyer, that's why I love you, man. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> I guess that's a great we idea. Go on to, um, before we go on to session five, I, I'm going to maybe pose a quick question to Jim. Um, not, not to put you on the spot, but since you're the only and, and NIH official uh, in this group. So there was a recommendation of what Rob said about um, you know, threatening or potentially withholding federal funds to institutions that don't accept Medicaid patients. Um, uh, is that, I mean, is that within NIH's purview to, to no. make a-, a, a No, no, I, I even think that's above Francis Collins's pay grade. <laughs> So, I mean, would that require some legislative action if, you know, if the country wanted to do that? Oh, yeah, I'm sure it could be done, uh, but it would take congressional action. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's clearly an important point. I'll just I'll give you another anecdote. Um, Larry said before that um, he might be the oldest person on the panel. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's true for this particular panel, but um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, some years ago, when I was on an external advisory board for a prominent cancer center, uh, we went to have a visit, <clears throat> and uh, they were extolling, you know, all of their plans for improving um, diversity in, in their patient population and their community engagement and outreach and so on. But it turned out that where they were located, um, there was no public transportation access from the inner city to the location of the cancer center. And furthermore, not only did they not accept Medicaid patients, they didn't accept Medicare patients. And <clears throat> the advisors were like, wait a minute, how much money are you spending you know, putting up these programs to talk to us about how you're gonna improve the diversity of your patient population when none of the people you say you wanna have in your patient population can actually get to you or afford care there. Um, so there are still, you know, this is some years ago and hopefully that's all changed. And, and there aren't examples like that going on now, but I, I wouldn't be so sure that's still not the case. Um, and it is a little bit like uh, <clears throat> Chris Lathan's point about um, uh, sort of managing the business operations of many institutions with their desire to uh, you know, invest in the communities that they wish to serve. Uh, and oftentimes the very communities that would most benefit from their service, you know, uh, represent populations that don't have the resources to be able to afford care at the center. And, you know, that's a, a very harsh reality, I think, of, of the U.S. healthcare system, but something that if we're serious about, we really are going to have to work to remedy in some way. Uh, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now, and uh, <clears throat> maybe we'll go to, uh, to uh, uh, panel five, and this is uh, Samir and Donna. Thank you. And I uh, also want to offer thanks to our panelists for a robust discussion this afternoon in the session that just preceded this one. So we put together these takeaways and I will discuss them and then Samir will go over our recommendations. I think it's important to acknowledge amid all the challenges of the pandemic, there are silver linings emerging around these key themes. So what we took from this session was the key theme of efficiency. There was an ability to have rapid trial initiation, consenting, implementation, a reduction in time on the process fees around approving protocols and contracts, and the use of remote assessments and rapid enrollment at sites within communities that was required and was possible. Around equity and access, I think COVID-19 uh, amid uh, our, our country's other uh, social justice conditions also amplified the need to increase representation and generate more inclusive evidence for broader populations. This includes access to decentralized trials, expanded enrollment, and really focusing on how we could bring a trial to a patient versus a patient to a trial. From a data and evidence perspective, it's expanding beyond the traditional RCT to rapidly generate data for public health purposes. This includes examples of pragmatic designs as well as use of real world data. 
Additionally, methods are required to ensure data management, integrity, and quality, and new strategies are part of this conversation. Finally, in this area, fit for purpose evidence development along the RCT to RWD continuum. So this in incorporates those novel trial designs. In the regulatory innovation context, it's processes that modernize drug development, review, authorization, and approval, and are patient-centric and supportive of the drug development community and academic community. And finally, collaboration, so extensive collaboration and stakeholder engagement between academic industry and regulators was demonstrated for vaccine and therapeutic trials at a level we previously have not seen. And I really agree with Doug in our session. I'm optimistic that we can collaboratively implement sustainable changes. And with that, I will turn it over to Samir. So in a way, uh, the recommendation that we put together uh, that reflect those key takeaways actually technically summarize probably most of the things that we've discussed today and yesterday uh, in all the sessions, because this is where the clinical trial for the next phase. Uh, Francis, can we go to the next slide? So, um, so there are six areas uh, that we have concentrated on from a recommendation perspective. One, enhance operational efficiency. So the faster initiation, faster approval, faster contracting process has to be put in place now. And quoting uh, um, Dr. Dorshaw here, it has to be institutionalized on all levels not only from, uh, from uh, funding uh, uh, agencies, but also on local levels. Re remote execution is highly important, and Doug mentioned it a couple of times, including consenting and auditing. Um, so the issues though, we have to identify the high risk areas uh, in implementation of something like this and develop mitigation strategies. Now this could apply to any of the points below, but I'm sure every institution would have risk assessment on those issues, and it has to be addressed beforehand, but it has to be proactive on all levels. Second, enhance inequity and increase in access. Trial at the patient site is extremely important, and, and you know, Rich, you mentioned that. So 15 years ago, uh, intramurally at NCI, we've conducted trials where patient did not need particularly during or in between courses to come to NCI, but rather had their uh, general checkup, sending, sending forms to patients or to the, to the physician on site and just do it, fill it up and send it to us. Now, the other thing is, which is really very important, especially going forward, and, and director of cancer centers know this, one of the major impediments in cancer center um, enrollment of patients on clinical trials is that local physicians don't want to send their patient to cancer centers. They want to keep them in because they believe that the patients are going to be stolen. You go to clinical trials, you will never go back to your private physician. So this is why that's a crucial to be able to conduct clinical trials where patients can be seen at their local physician's site as much as possible because that would send a signal to local physicians that yes, enroll patients on clinical trials as much as possible. So this is really a very important and extremely uh, crucial part of enhancing clinical trial enrollment anyway. So that would require a determining of the, of the incentives to do, be able to do that. Uh, prioritize trial innovation, um, especially design, new designs. We've discussed a lot on different ways. Uh, Derek in our uh, session discussed a uh, few of the adaptive designs, but also the issue is can we use real world data in, in integrate, as integrated part of the clinical design? And can we, uh, as we discussed before, eliminate potential uh, um, use of um, controls in, in certain um, clinical trials? So that would require, of course, ensuring data quality, data governance, interoperability, and others. So these are some of the issues that has to be put in place before we can do something like this or in certain uh, uh, areas expand on. The fourth area is 
modernizing regulatory requirement that includes simplify study endpoint and reporting requirement. Uh, so the issues is, again, there is a risk assessment of such, of such simplifications or making them uh, at least easier in addition to retrospective and prospective valuation of the effect of remote assessment uh, and deviation on such trials. So that's an important part that has to be uh, looked into prior to the fourth recommendations. The fifth recommendation is maintain collaboration. You know, I, you know we discussed this on, on many levels is, is everything happened because of a sense of urgency. So I think it's important to maintain that sense of urgency somehow. Uh, rather than going back to the modus operandum that we were in before um, and, and feel that this is an important part of defining incentive for wide collaboration because other, uh, other than that, it's going to be really a step backward. The final one, which is most tricky, is can we develop new financial models to be able to conduct clinical trials, whether in reevaluation of the role of the middle organization, i.e. CROs, because of the cost of the clinical trials and because of the ability of to conduct clinical trials much cheaper and way faster. There are, um, there are um, examples of this like uh, Claris in Boston, which they started actually conducting clinical trials and putting some sort of potential equity within uh, the future uh, use of such, uh, such um, um, drugs. So there are some models that are being developed within the country, uh, but I think we need to look at them more carefully. And then restructure trial pricing models and develop healthcare system incentives. Um, De-risking of trial through purchase agreements, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned in, uh, in our sessions. And finally, collaboration of funding agencies. So these are the different things that we believe that one, need to be put forward. And second, some of the risk mitigation that has to be looked at prior to putting some of those in place. Well, th <clears throat> thank you both. Really, um, some terrific recommendations. I, I'm actually I'm curious to ask Tony and Jim if they have any reflection on this. Since you know th this session was sort of the rejoinder to your session, uh, you were the setup, and you know they were the designated hitters. Uh, and uh, just curious as to. Um, as to whether you have any uh, response to what you see here. Well, there's a lot of parallels between both sessions and, and most of the takeaways and recommendations are overlapping, which help us uh, uh, think that we agree on many things. And uh, I think that after this workshop, we hope that we convey that these are the areas that need to be maintained uh, because they're recurrent themes across these two sessions and all of the sessions. So I wanted to ask um, really all of you, but I'll start with uh, you know, those of you involved focusing more on research. One of the areas that we didn't really talk much about, but that Rob Caleb touched on briefly in his, I thought really wonderful talk um, is, um, <clears throat> is reporting of research results. Um, and there really are two uh, aspects of that. Uh, one is um, what, is the potential influence of medical journal editors in terms of requiring that, let's say, for example, data on social determinants of health be reported alongside the results of a clinical trial in order to get that clinical trial published in a high impact factor journal. Um, you know, uh, the ICMJE put in a requirement that um, uh, there be a data sharing plan that is included alongside the manuscript that's proposing to. Uh, you know, to publish a high uh, impact clinical trial in any of their journals. And lo and behold, all the sponsors started putting in data sharing plans. So that's one, one question. The other question um, has to do with the role of um, preprint servers and other means of communicating research results. I mean, we witnessed during COVID a lot of misinformation being put out there or maybe not so much misinformation, but oftentimes a lot of misinterpretation of information by various rapporteurs who were reading scientific articles on preprint servers and then interpreting them for the lay public uh, in a way that was incorrect or incomplete. Um, so, you know, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on 
the issues surrounding reporting of research results and how that might actually be improved or how it can help us achieve some of our goals around you know, making uh, cancer research more equitable and efficient and even interpretable. Well, Rich, you're very familiar with the remark guidelines, right? Which completely changed the way we, um, we do biomarker research. And that was just an agreement. It was a publication. It was a, it was a, a meeting with, a, with a, uh, the appropriate community that came together on, these are the things that you need to, to, uh, to do. And uh, it's made, it made an enormous difference. So I think that journal editors have an enormous amount of say in this area. It could change things dramatically. There may be another group we need to engage in some of these discussions. All right, I see a lot of um, heads nodding, so <clears throat> I'll I take also, you know, I, I wanted to just take a, a quick stab at um, the journals. One of the biggest things that came out of um, the COVID sort of um, pandemic that we're getting through is that there is real work to be done and high impact and high level research in and around health equity and, and, and disparities. I think that that has been a field in and of itself that has actually been emerging over time and certainly over the last 20, 25 years has certainly gotten better. But when you really see some of the impact of some of the health disparities issues that need to be addressed, I don't think that many of our journals actually know what to do with that and are frequently sort of uncomfortable about the kinds of research and the levels of research and, and, and the new types of research that are emerging as a result of our being investigating that. So I think as we move forward through COVID, one of the other lessons learned from me, thinking about this as, I don't know what my one go-to journal is actually, to be quite honest with you, if I was like, this is the highest impact level of just health disparities research. And most of that's because I don't think that we as a group have actually gotten together and said in our JAMAs and our wherever else and you know the cancer that health disparities research really is substantive and here's what it could look like. So I think that that's one of the things that I hope that a, a discussion at least comes out of this about where does that research, which turns out to be very important um, for both our rural communities and for some of our urban underserved and at-risk populations, how does that actually get mainstreamed a little bit better than it has been in the past? Since we're on the journal question, um, I actually wanted to add, because I think one thing that um, changed during the COVID pandemic is that the journals removed the paywall. Um, and that I think really helped get the research out to a much wider group of um, clinicians, researchers, patients, and advocates. Um, and so I think that is something that we may need to think about and maybe um, advocate uh, for to really expand um, the availability of research findings to a much broader community. Yeah, that's a great point. <clears throat> Uh, Rob, I'm going to ask you to pick up on, <clears throat> or actually to um, comment on one other thing that um, occurs to me that we haven't spoken much about, and then we're going to move to, to wrap up. And that is, um, how do we create the next generation of researchers in health disparities research? Is, is that a valid career path? Um, you know, will institutions invest in young people who may not have an easy time getting that work funded, who may not generate a lot of clinical revenue in the process of doing it, who may demand a lot of resources in order to uh, move their programs forward. Um, and yet, I mean, if we're serious about it, it seems to me that that's one element of institutional investment that has to be made that we really haven't discussed in this workshop. I think um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Latham who said that, you know, we constantly make decisions to do sort of research and, and spend millions of dollars on things um, that we may not get a benefit from. I, I will say the following, we are not going to get people uh, on diverse clinical trials or diversify our clinical trials without actually having, I, I believe, a diverse workforce of people very interested in health disparities. And so if we are serious about closing the gap, we're gonna have to get serious about it and meaning that health disparities, um, we really should, I think, invest 
and um, uh, some people may call it a reinvestment, but I think it's the first time that a true investment in developing the kinds of science. The issue is, again, with some of the implementation type stuff that we're learning, the issues around trust, the basic issues. I mean, I remember at the beginning of this whole thing, there was a, was it, you know, with the Tempers 2 and ACE. So I think that there's a role for biology, high level, high impact biological scientists within health disparities, as well as the social uh, and implementation scientists. So the answer for me is, how are we going to do it? I think it's like a diet. We know it has benefits. We know actually how to do it. We just have to actually do it. Um, so one of those things is I'm having cancer center directors and, and some of our agencies really do more than just give lip service, but how do we form those pipelines that are sustainable? And I would just add that there are a number of organizations, including the American Cancer Society, that have allocated millions of dollars in funding to healthcare and cancer disparities research specifically and enhance that further through the course of the pandemic. So that's great to hear, Karen. And, you know, I wonder if there would, you know, would be some opportunity, maybe it's happened, but for the ACS in some way to summarize what, you know, what has been learned from all those millions of dollars spent, you know, are there best practices that can be disseminated and adopted, um, you know, and, and, and so on, so that, um, you know, as many institutions as possible can benefit from the findings of those research studies. Without question. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, we have not had any questions from the audience, which just leads me to wonder if we still have an audience, but um, I'm, I'm assuming that somebody out there is still listening. Um, <clears throat> but maybe as a way of moving toward uh, wrapping up, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna ask you each to sort of give me um, your recommendation as to the major adaptation that has been made during COVID in care or research that we really want to be sure sticks going forward. Um, you know, we've, um, we've recognized that, uh, you know, and we've talked a lot about how COVID's created a sense of uh, urgency uh, in, um, you know, in, in, in the way we've delivered care, uh, in the way we have conducted research. A lot of that was done out of the need to protect patients and protect staff and maintain services. Um, but you know, going forward, um, what do we need to do uh, to keep the momentum going? So you know, I'm, I'm gonna go in a certain order here, um, <clears throat> but I'm gonna ask you to just think about if there's one thing that you think should be done um, and if there's a barrier to doing it, how should we overcome that? Um, what would that be? So. I'm going to start with um, Larry and, and uh, Nancy in, in session one. You know, Rich, we uh, talked about at the beginning that, that we think that we need to stay streamlined and lean. You know, we talked in our session about how we really stretch the rubber band and to do things we hadn't done before. And we don't want to be in a position where it snap, snaps back to where it was before. So we have to maintain the, the you know, let's lose the red tape that we've already lost. Let's uh, trim the bureaucracy that we've already lost uh, where we know that we did it and it didn't compromise our patients in any way, shape or form from a care point of view or a research point of view. Um, and that's a lot of the things that we've talked about. There, there are the specifics there, but not to lose the ground that we've already gained. Yeah, to be sure. I mean, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can find some good examples. Uh, you know, I know at your institution, Nancy, there's a lot of, um, change going on at the moment. You're one of the institutional leaders. Um, you know, can you give us an example of something you're doing in Seattle to, you know, reduce the bureaucracy and minimize the red tape? I am hoping that uh, we're going to use the opportunity of the COVID pandemic, if you could say that there are opportunities, to really trim a lot of the stuff that's wrapped around our clinical trial mechanisms. You know, we got a lot of different organizations with a lot of different rules, a lot of duplicative processes. Um, we learned, as was pointed out, that we can activate COVID trials pretty quickly when we need to. Um, and so we need to take that same kind of innovation that we put there and apply it to our cancer trials. Great. Well, maybe you'll, you'll have an opportunity to report back at some point um, uh, whether you've been successful or not. And if not, why not? Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, let's go to session four. I'm going to go back to um, uh, 
to uh, Rob and Randy. Um, you know, what's something that uh, has changed um, that you think really needs to stick going forward? Randy, you want to start? Sure, thanks, Rob. Uh, I would say the urgency of adding the patient voice to everything that we do. Uh, you know, it was a theme in the research sessions. It was a theme in the clinical sessions as well. And I guess the barriers would be, again, doing something that we heard from our um, from our patient advocate, giving them a real voice, giving them some authority, giving them a seat at the table with a vote, not some sort of weak patient advisory committee that you consult when you want and you ignore when you want. That's one barrier. And the other barrier is selecting the right patient who has the time, the knowledge, et cetera. You know, uh, Jane Perlmuter that uh, was in uh, Tony's session, for example, was an extraordinary patient advocate. Um, but we've got to make sure that the advocacy voice, I think, is, um, is heard across the entire spectrum of our, of our patient needs. So selecting the right patient with enough uh, voices and representations of communities, I think that maybe it's not a barrier, but it's uh, something for attention. Thank you. I would just quickly follow that up with what I've learned is that um, all scientific miracles also have limitations. And so that limitations goes at the edge of trust. And the only way to have trust is for our institutions not to just drop into these communities every once in a while, but to really have long, sustainable, consistent presence. And part of bringing science closer to the community can be just as simple as actually hiring people from the community to be some of our community educators and navigators. Um, and if there is something that I'll never go back to, it's the bad old days of just thinking that I can hire someone out of medical school that's going to be my community navigator. And why not actually hire the people from the community? So that's my move forward. All right, great. <clears throat> um, I want to go to next to um, uh, Larissa, back to Larissa and Karen. Um, and you know what what uh, there are a lot of things, very specific things that were discussed in your session that um, you might choose to highlight. But what do you think, you know, what change really needs to stick going forward to make a difference? Larissa, you want to start? Well, so since um, we're expected to say um, we want telehealth um, to continue, um, and, and well, it should, um, you know, and telehealth is not a replacement for an in-person visit. Um, and that we need to be thoughtful in how we use telemedicine, telehealth, um, and really triage the patients accor accordingly, um, seeking also the, the patient voice um, in whether they prefer a telehealth visit or if they prefer an in-person visit, what needs to be discussed at the, um, at the visit and um, and then determine whether they need to come in um, or, or not. But I was actually not going to say telehealth. And I was going to say that as much as I love to travel and see everyone in person, I think that these virtual meetings have really allowed us to engage a much wider audience. And we were able to expand the reach of the COVID literature, of the cancer and COVID literature, and, and um, bring in um, advocates and patients and organizations to the table that have traditionally not been here. So um, I really wanna get on the plane again and I really wanna see people in person. But I think to some extent we need to have the sort of the virtual teleconference stick. And sorry, Karen, if I <laughs> just- No, I, I completely agree with everything that my colleagues said uh, and I'm gonna layer on something slightly different. I'm also not gonna say it's telehealth. Here's the two things I'm gonna quickly opine on. One is that there was an innovation that sat unused because it didn't fit a convenient financial model. And we all saw the benefit of being able to escalate that for those of us who had it. So I would say one, let's look at the current innovations and understand what can and should be escalated for the greater good of patients. And two, let's continue to innovate. It's not gonna stop with telehealth. It'll be telehealth associated with a wearable or telehealth associated with a monitor in someone's house. So let's continue that push because we know that patients want to be at home as much as possible. And if you're a cancer patient, why wouldn't you? So let's respect that. Let's innovate around it and move forward. Great. Um, let's go to uh, Tony and Jim next. 
Well, well it's clear that uh, we were told don't go back for a reason because there's things that we can improve and we should improve and we were forced to improve because we had no other option. That shouldn't be the way that we work. But I want to get to one point, which is if we want to have cancer care during the COVID-19 pandemic, the first goal would be to end the pandemic. And I think the no better way to do this is to build even more confidence on the vaccines by being able to say that cancer care is given by 100% vaccinated people. I think that has to be a goal because if we don't set the example, it's hard to convey it to others. I, I, Rob had a very, very good point that we have to, go to be in the communities and understand the communities. The confidence in the vaccine is the important thing. It's not the hesitance. We as a medical community gave hesitance to some people and we have to build that com, uh, uh, confidence back and we should be the first example to do that. Okay, well, as you saw yesterday, there were 60 uh, medical organizations that came out in support of mandatory vaccination for healthcare workers, as well as an announcement from the VA that they were also gonna be making it mandatory in their healthcare system. So um, hopefully that will um, you know, stimulate some momentum along those lines. Uh, Jim, did you wanna add anything? Uh, I'm just gonna echo not only what Tony said, but others. I, I, I know this is a terrible, I hate this phrase, but actually, you know, I'll try to use it in a good way. I, I hope we've reached a new normal. That in fact, um, you know, we, we aren't we aren't going to be satisfied to um, to do the way things said things the way they've been done for so long. Um, and and maybe if this symposium, uh, if there's any one thing about it, it's that we all agree on that point, and that uh, we need to make that clear to all of our uh, colleagues. Great. <clears throat> so I'll turn now to Adana and Samir um, and to ask for your comments as to what single adaptation um, do you think is essential to maintain going forward? Uh, and what are the obstacles, if any, to doing so? So I'm just going to follow up on Jim's because that was the issue that I really wanted to put forefront is there's lots of um, not only planning here, but there's lots of public relation here. And it is not only with government, it's not only with Congress, is not only with institutions or with the public, is we really need to keep that sense of urgency of where we are. We have used a pandemic, which is a sense of urgency catastrophe that led us to here. The last thing we want to do is just sit back and raise our feet now if that pandemic is controlled. We really need to keep this. And NCPF is one, ASCO is another, uh, uh, the society, the, the uh, cancer society is a third. I mean, everybody needs to keep that on because this means that everyone will be on edge. And all those things that we put on each one of our second uh, slides would be a priority. It's not one thing that should be a priority. Every single one of them would be a priority because if one of them is a priority and the rest is not, then that one priority is going to dwindle down to where it was. I think this is what we need is to just to keep that sense of urgency up front and central. So somehow the FDA always gets the last word. Um, so we'll, um, we'll turn to Donna. Thank you. Well, I, I think from, from where I, I sit in OCE leading real world evidence, I think I would have to say uh, from my lens, the adaptation is really the awareness and exploration of alternative methods for evidence generation. I think we've seen the, the, the flexibilities, the modifications in RCTs. Data lo might look more complex and, and has that, uh, you know, opened the door? Has it opened the door to rethinking what's possible in terms of decentralization, hybrid and pragmatic designs, and where real world data can be really informative for emerging public health needs. I think as we've, as we've seen with COVID, but also where is it fit for purpose to be complementary to trials and especially in oncology. And we've seen good examples and we've seen poor quality examples and it's what we can learn from those. There's a lot of real world data available, much less real world evidence. And so I think this is gonna require a collaborative effort within the community to advance data quality, 
advanced methods and inter interoperability to harness the potential of real world data and these designs toward a learning healthcare system that's patient centric, provides clinical evidence generation in a fit for purpose way without compromising data integrity and scientific standards. What are the barriers? And I think what is the how is really what we're getting at. I think it might start with foundational definitions and methods. Rob mentioned the glossary and we're taking that recommendation forward within the FDA. I think additionally, it's characterization of data quality, development and acceleration development of endpoints and understanding the biases in these fit for purpose objectives. Finally, I just wanna emphasize the OCE is open to novel trial designs and conduct strategies. So please come to us uh, early and often and we'll review these proposals in the context of the drugs and diseases under study and, and provide advice. Thank you. Great. Well, what a great uh, way to conclude this uh, session. Um, we're going to move now to just a few uh, opening remarks. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking uh, all six of, or however many of you there are, all 10 of you um, who, um, who co-moderated these sessions, both for your work in planning them, um, organizing them, identifying outstanding speakers, and moderating them. Uh, I think um, this workshop certainly exceeded all of my expectations, and I hope you all enjoyed participating, and I hope our audience enjoyed it as well and learned something. <clears throat> it's clear that uh, we can't just walk the we can't just talk the talk. We have to walk the walk. We have to um, not only talk about what needs to be done. We have to own it. Um, all of you are leaders in your organizations, and um, you know you and your colleagues have to take responsibility for moving as many of these recommendations forward as possible, recognizing the complexity of uh, many of them. Um, as, a, as a concluding slide, uh, I wonder if you could put my slide up now. I, uh, I took the opportunity to try to summarize in one slide uh, what I distilled uh, from this uh, workshop. So here is my word cloud. Um, and I hope you won't take it too literally. I'm not too good at making these things. So um, don't put too much stock in the size or location of any particular word, um, but I hope that um, we, we have made the point now on several occasions over the last two days that flexibility, collaboration, communication, the use of telehealth, uh, cooperation, building trust in communities, uh, paying attention to the importance of the social determinants of health to achieve uh, equitable care and research, uh, all of these things are essential uh, for us to improve our healthcare system, improve the way in which we deliver care, improve the access of all people uh, to high quality cancer care, and to making our research as accessible and efficient uh, as possible. So um, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you all again for your participation. And to those of you uh, who've been listening in, thank you for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.